We've got the list of the world's most livable cities for 2024. And just as I do every year, I've got some complaints about the best cities on this list because I don't think these lists take what a nomad capitalist wants into account. So today we're gonna share the best all the way down to the worst. So every year, The Economist and their sister unit, the EIU, put out the most livable cities. I believe it's heavily skewed to the West, a part of the world that here at Nomad Capitalist we think is moving in the right direction. One of the things that you see and we're going to talk about today is how there's more competition coming from regions like Asia. And I think that's important because if you're looking for a place to move, you want to consider all the options, not just the one in your own Western bubble. And I'm also gonna share with you how these least livable cities aren't places you'd wanna live in the first place. I'm gonna challenge the notion that if you're looking to go somewhere, that you have to necessarily be in the top 10. So, least livable, let's start with that. Damascus, Tripoli, Algiers, Lagos, Karachi, Port Moresby in the, is it Papua New Guinea, Dhaka, Bangladesh, Harare, Kiev, you can imagine why that is. And uh, Douala, I think it's in Cameroon. So those are the, the, the bottom 10. Now, there was a time, not that long ago, when a certain class of digital nomad would say, I'm gonna go to Ukraine. Could have been for dating opportunities, could have been they were you know, building a big back office, hiring people in Ukraine. Obviously, that's not uh, so livable anymore. The rest of those cities, has anyone ever thought, you know what, if only I could move to Douala or Algiers. Algiers was really high on the list, but you know, now that it's 171st, I mean, forget it, honey. And so when people talk to us here at Nomad Capitalist, when the audience, and they say, I don't agree with your philosophy of going where you're treated best to lower your taxes, to have more freedom, to just have an adventure, see the opportunities that are coming up in the world, you might as well stay in the United States. Everyone's moving there. Well, who's moving to the United States? Who's moving to any of the places that I'm going to share with you that are the most livable? In most cases, it's not high net worth, high earners. It is people who are looking for a better job. And so if you're already successful, if you're the kind of person that we work with and you've got a million dollars or more liquid, or you have a very high income, your issue is not about how are you getting around or how's the public transportation? Your issue is, am I getting what I'm paying for? Because in some of these most livable places, healthcare is mentioned. And yet we talk to clients from these places and they say, I, I don't bother with public healthcare. It's ridiculous. It doesn't work. Most livable cities in the world. Number one, Vienna. Nice place. Would I live there? Well, what I've argued is uh, a lot of people I know who moved to Austria, and I love Austrians. I love the Austrian people. But they say it's really hard in, same in a lot of Central European places, it's hard to make friends. It's hard to get in. There's places in Eastern Europe I've gone. There's places in Southeast Asia I've gone. To a lesser extent, Latin America, just because I'm not as fluent in the language, uh, where I've made friends. In some cases, they've been my friend for many years now. We talk on a repeated basis. I made friends much more easily there than people tell me they do in Germany or Austria or Switzerland. Nothing wrong with that, but that should be a factor of livability. We'll talk about the factors in a minute and why they're not so uh, interesting. Copenhagen, that's just one of those that's perennially up there on the list. Okay, if you live in Copenhagen, congratulations, you're number two on the list. Is anybody moving to Copenhagen to pay 58% tax? I doubt it. Melbourne, now, one of the things, Melbourne, Australia, uh, the Economist says the world's cities have recovered from the ravages of COVID. Uh, Melbourne was kind of uh, ground zero for some of that stuff. And to me, livability should include, uh, did your country forbid you to enter after you paid them a bloody fortune in taxes over the years uh, <laughs> during COVID? Uh, that's kind of like against all the rules. You can't enter your own country, but they did it in Australia. So maybe having some little slivers of freedom should be included, but no, 97.7 out of 100. That's what Melbourne gets. Sydney, 97.4. Uh, Vancouver, 97.3. Uh, Zurich, Calgary, and Geneva tied. 
Uh, and then Toronto, Osaka, and Auckland. Good food in Osaka. Out of that, uh, you could live in Geneva. They tied for seventh. They have a, uh, they're part of uh, Switzerland's lump sum tax deal. So you could pay a flat amount, depending on your citizenship, several hundred grand a year in taxes. As if you are a very high earner, uh, that could be a tax friendly place to live. It was just in Geneva recently. It's, a, it, it's very functional, no doubt about it. Auckland bit more tax friendly than some of the other English speaking countries. But generally speaking, what these countries all have in common is, uh, besides not so great weather in many cases, is they have really high taxes. And there's a veneer of just how they're great. Let's see why The Economist ranks these cities. What's the criteria they use? They use stability. Okay, you could argue they're stable. Again, I don't know how stable it is that if you go on a holiday the wrong time and then some black swan event happens, you're stuck in God knows where for two years, but okay, there's stability. No doubt about it. I would argue that there's plenty of stability in many other places around the world. Again, we're not, when you come to Nomad Capitalist, I'm not telling you to move to Dhaka, to Bangladesh. I think perhaps you should look at investing in Bangladesh. I think it's one of the top three or four interesting real estate markets for the next 10 years. I'm not saying you should move there. And so, Sure, they may not have that much stability in Bangladesh. Some very unfortunate stuff happening there in the last uh, month or two. But does that mean that nearby Kuala Lumpur doesn't have stability? I push back on that. Healthcare. Again, I'd argue the healthcare in places in Southeast Asia where you pay for it yourself, living in very tax friendly countries where you can just pay private healthcare, private hospitals. Amazing. It's fast. It's zippy. We've talked about that multiple times over the years. I. Okay, I mean, sure, people aren't dying in the streets in Europe. Um, they're not, you know, here's the secret. They're not dying in the streets in most places. Maybe in these bottom 10 places, maybe in a few more. I've been all over the world. I don't see a lot of people dying in the streets. Uh, that's kind of a, an idea that people have in a Western bubble that like, if you ever leave the US, Canada, the UK, and Italy, there's just massive death and destruction everywhere. And we have to live in one of the, we stay in Calgary. This doesn't work that way. Culture and the environment, no doubt. I mean, there's certain culture that you get in Vienna that it's hard to get somewhere else. Uh, again, if I'm making a high income, how many operas? I, I like going to the opera. I like going to the ballet. If you told me to go every day, I'd get sick of it. Just like eating a, you know, a filet mignon every day, eating a Wagyu beef. I mean, you get sick of it every day. Just as, you know, occasionally I go out for a nice meal, Get a nice, uh, get a nice dish. Get something fancy. You know what? Sometimes I sit at home, and I reminisce, and I order, you know, four tacos from Taco Bell. In the same way, why couldn't you live in a tax-friendly place? And, you know, with all the money you're saving, go to Vienna four times a year. Go and see a museum. Go to a show. Let them have their high taxes. Let them have their regulations. Uh, let them have everything that they have that's not taken into account here, and you just go and enjoy as a welcomed guest. I think there's something to that. Uh, culture and the environment. And listen, no doubt, I mean, there's, you know, some of these countries, particularly like in South Asia, Central Asia, the environment is not great. There's plenty of places with good environment. Uh, there's plenty of places that have, you know, that's solved. Education, you can solve that for yourself. I mean, by the way, now, the U.S. is not in the, none of the cities are in the top 10, but many cities have top tier scores. Does anybody think the United States, which has some of the worst education scores in the Western world, does anybody really think that they're leading in education? Canada? I'm not so sure. Infrastructure. Uh, I think the roads are better in a lot of the places that I live in up and coming emerging markets than they are where I was born in Cleveland, Ohio. I just do now. Cleveland's not the most livable, but I mean, are you telling me? I remember, I remember driving to Los Angeles many, many years ago on that I-10 freeway. The minute you'd leave Arizona and cross into California, you felt like you had a flat tire because the roads were just so terrible. There's the list of the top 10 of the bottom 10. And I wanted to share this with you because again, what we talked about here at Nomadic Capitalist is you want to have a residence permit or permits in other countries when stuff goes bad. You want to have citizenship as a backup plan for your freedom and for money grabs by your government. That's the plan B. The plan A, ideally you get to, if not now, at some point is, you're gonna move, at least for a good chunk of the year, to some other place or places. And so I'm a big believer in uh, 
qualitative data. We published the Nomad Passport Index every year. We published other indices over the years that rank everything from passports to beaches. Uh, so I'm a big fan of qualitative data. The question is, what is this data? The Economist uses a lot of things like, how good is the, the metro system? I'm not saying you have to drive your car everywhere. I live in places in city centers where I often walk to where I want to go. And you know what? If you got a car, I mean, what's so bad about that? Why are we ranking if you have a, a high income? Why are we determining what's the most livable place based on whether there's a tram that goes by the front of your house? So are these top tier cities really the best? If you earn a million dollars a year, you're going to pay close to half of that in any of these places. Could you get better health care, better culture, better education living somewhere else? And could you find places that had, you know, relatively equal stability and infrastructure? The idea that only these most livable places, which again are very Western, are stable, uh, I just happen to find uh, a little bit silly. Uh, do you really think, if you look back over the last number of years, I mean, look at what's happening in the United States. There's shootings. It's terrible what's happening. Like almost every day, someone's being shot. You look at what's happened, more violence in some of these Western countries. I mean, Australia totally lost the plot uh, in recent years. And you pay them a fortune for that privilege. You're not getting great education. I mean, some of these Western countries, the education is better than others. But could you not replicate that? If you earn a million dollars a year, could you not take $500,000 a year, pay for all your own health care privately? Anywhere. I mean, even in these places. But, of course, they're not going to give you your half a million dollars back. Could you not get great health care in many places in the world? Listen, in, in, in Cameroon, you probably couldn't. You got me there. But even in a place like Cambodia, let's just go to like one of the, the more frontier markets in Asia. Forget Kuala Lumpur, Singapore, Bangkok. Uh, the Asian cities are the ones that are kind of creeping up the rankings versus Europe. Uh, even in Cambodia, since I've been going 10 years ago, the quality of health care is amazing. When I first went, like, yeah, I was a little bit afraid. But I mean, I'm young, but okay, if something happens, I'm a little bit freaked out. Uh, now I'm not freaked out. And so the number of places where you have to be freaked out with bad stability, bad infrastructure, bad health care, they're shrinking. The one part of the world that just has not gone up that much is Latin America. They uh, have, according to The Economist, struggled, and I maybe agree with more of their rankings there, although I do like uh, spending some time in Latin America. If you have a high income or if you have a high net worth, some of these countries even have wealth taxes in Europe, not many left, but a few, you don't think you could create that for yourself somewhere else. And so the question is, why are you following a ranking system? Why are you following a system of thinking that's designed for people who aren't like you? This is not class warfare. This is not saying to look down on people. This is to say we all do things for our own reasons. Almost every single client we've ever had who comes from Mexico asked about moving to Canada. They, they all came during or after the Trump administration, so the U.S. was off their list. But Canada, I said, do you like cold weather? No. Uh, do you like high taxes? No. Do you like a more progressive uh, education system? No, we're more conservative. Well, this is imagining your criteria, but that's become the name brand for them. Many different countries have their name brand. Many people in Central America, for example, the name brand is we want to go to the U.S. They want more economic opportunities. But at a certain point, you cross over from, hey, I'm having a real hard time finding a job to pay and there's violence in my country. I'm going to go to the U.S. That's not the ringing endorsement of your country you think it is. Same in any country in Europe. People are moving there. And so you can get a lot of the stuff that they're talking about anywhere, especially if you have some money. And if you are successful, then you have different needs. One of the few areas where I think the mushy middle can work to your advantage is in terms of these livable cities lists if you're successful. Um, even some of the places that I like, uh, on the list. I like the smaller towns in Switzerland. I think Ireland is a standout uh, in Europe in terms of just um, ease of dealing with the government, in terms of you know tax friendliness. I would take smaller towns in uh, Switzerland. I'd take Dublin over a lot of these places. And I think that if you have a very high income, you probably would as well. But they are kind of in the middle on these lists. I'm not a big fan of the mushy middle, but here, considering that the stuff they put at the top of the ranking can be replicated, I think that these scores are needlessly focused on expensive Western countries.
And so what's interesting is that the global average lifestyle score plummeted in 2020. My life didn't. If you were living in these, these best places, do you know how many clients we had from Canada? I can't even leave the country. That's how it treated you. I was traveling around the world. I had a pretty good life, 2020, 2021, because I was diversified, had places in different countries, and I just followed the progression of how the world was going at the time. My livability score didn't plummet. And it's in part because I wasn't relying on these places that weren't very livable. I mean, obviously, every place went down in the rankings in 2020. Now there's thing it's back. But being diversified helped me have more livability. And at the same time, I didn't get stuck in some country where, oh, my goodness, I didn't plan on being here six months of the year, but now I owe a fortune in taxes. These things all matter. Now, uh, Nomad Capitalist Live is our annual event. Uh, we are going to be hosting it for the second time in Kuala Lumpur. Put me to the test. That is the uh, premier gathering of global citizens. We've got more than three dozen speakers and experts talking about everything from the best places to live, from real world experience, talking about the latest tax reduction strategies, asset protection strategies, the best second passports to get, stuff we don't always necessarily talk about on YouTube or our podcast. We've got a whole slew of people coming in who are frontier markets investment experts who have real world on the ground experience. If you're looking for how to invest in these places that are coming up but you wouldn't live in. Come to Kuala Lumpur. Maybe you get a medical procedure, and that will certainly pay for your entire trip and for your ticket. Go to nomadcapitalist.com slash live and put me to the test. Come to one of the places that I call home that is in that mushy middle and see if you couldn't have a highly livable life there. And even if you don't like it, which I think you will, you'll have four days with us at Nomad Capitalist Live. My team's coming. I'm speaking, we've got Nigel Farage, we've got the CEO of AirAsia, we've got more capitalists than ever before telling you how you can thrive in a global world. That's something worth seeing. And, and while you're doing it, come and check out KL, Malaysia, and anywhere else in Asia that you want to. And I think that you'll see the reason Asia scores are rising and the reason why I've chosen to focus the places I live as a successful person, not in the top 10.